Okay, welcome. You, you're expecting today Nat to do his session on um, Albert Collins and Albert Kings, the two Alberts, rather than the three Kings. And um, uh, it's a more British approach to the two Alberts. Sounds like a pub, isn't it? Um, now, um, we talked and he's doing six sessions on the blues, of course. And with the way we're doing it, everything is normally language-based. So immediately, you know, we, we don't really want to spend too much time on taking a single lick and dissecting it. It's more about getting idiosyncratic language, which getting it going, moving on the fretboard, doing stuff that sort of takes you a little bit out of the comfort zone, maybe things like this. So we're trying to, you know, keep that interesting um, from that level. However, it allows us now, with that little break, to have a chance to look into a little bit of what's going on behind the scenes of some of those bits in order to set us up for the sessions to come because Nat will, will do a sessions now on, on, on the two Alberts. Um, uh, then it will go to the two the two Vaughan, Steve Vaughan and Jimmy Vaughan. Um, and from then onwards, it will all go into, into the modern player. So we're looking first at Robin Ford, then we're looking at Matt Schofield and then Josh Smith. And it, all of them, of course, incorporating, especially from Robin Ford onwards, they're incorporating much more advanced harmony than um, you, you, know, you have in, in a traditional blues scene, really. Not that traditional blues players, as we learned already last week, are by no means you know, not equipped with some serious chromatic runs, which we, we looked at that. Then, um, you know, there's some, some uh, implied diminished harmony, what we've seen last week. There's all sorts of, of bending the rules um, quite cleverly, so therefore quite informed. Some of it is, of course, um, cultural, culturally informed. Some of it is um, directly, you know, theoretically informed, you know, by making a minor scale work over a major, um, uh, over major context and things like this, or B.B. King, no problem having a major third on a minor blues, you know, a famous, famous solo to Thrill is Gone, where he does this little, maybe I've turned the volume up. He does that one, I do this a bit quieter, so we're not deaf by the end of this session. And, um, uh, and it's on a minor blues. Um, basically, so all of those sort of things, they're really not allowed, such as, um, uh, but when you, when you hear them in context, and you see this is all part of the bigger language, some of it culturally, so therefore we can't say it's particularly right. Um, from any other reason, but people do it, sounds okay. And um, and some of it really is informed, like some of the diminished things, some of the flat nines, used to reward, you know, we're coming to this using um, uh, flat nines quite frequently over a dominant chord, and that comes originally actually from a, probably from a, from a jazz background. The other thing we found out is that we actually almost made a full circle, and that's a very interesting one. Um, most of the blues players, so when we talked about T-Bone Walker um, last week, they're coming out of a big band setting. So they're actually quite informed generally when it comes down to harmony because that's the music of the day. And then it went into rock and roll and into blues and actually the harmony almost disappeared a bit like punk took over rock in a way, um, where it was all there but it wasn't really used and you know it was sort of much more based on the on the basic framework of a one four five. The twelve bar became a thing, which which blues traditionally didn't actually have. It's some, something that's sort of um, more added um, um, over the years. There's a whole bunch of history you, if you want to read up on. It's quite exciting on that too. And then um, after that, you're now having all of a sudden that whole thing coming back again. So with the eighties and nineties, all of a sudden people added the things. They were sort of already in the fifties and sixties, often there. And um, I've prepared for us a, a couple of things really, which um, allow us to just expand on our normal harmony, on our comping, and allow us to hopefully freely comp and freely to um, uh, uh, you know, react also in an improvised sense, because blues is an improvised style, an improvised sense to, um, uh, you know, to whatever is going on harmonically or melodically around us and, um, uh, and we can sort of, you know, not getting stuck too much in boxes and things like this. The first thing we're going to look at is something called a chord fragment. Anybody knows a chord fragment, what a chord fragment is? What's a chord fragment? Part a, a part of a chord, yeah? Um, one, of the, one of the big things we learn is when we learn guitar is somebody going, okay, here's a shape. And often the shape is a whole, it has everything in it, all the colors in it. And that's great because we're sitting there, we play, and it sounds like everything. We have a bass note in there, we have a fifth in there to thicken up the bass note, then we have all the other, the tenor colors in there, then we have all the, um, the alto colors in there, and depending how high you go up, you have even some, some um, uh, soprano colors in there. So you're having all the different range of sonic in one chord. And that's kind of cool when you're playing in a small setting, and that's cool when you want to have a big impact. But 
it's not always the best approach. So a lot of the times when you see players play, they might do something like this. They might come. Yeah, so you're ending up with um, a small part of a chord and maybe a little riff. So something that moves when you have melodic movement inside a chord that's consistent, we call it a riff rather than um, you know, when, we, um, uh, when we play melodic lines by, by themselves, especially when they're repetitive, yeah, it's called, called a riff. Cool, so in order to practice chord fragments, there's a couple of really nice exercises, and I've put one down here on this little sheet, and I'm just gonna hand out the first sheet of this, and I'm just gonna give a couple of rounds of those. I'm just gonna give you all three, actually. Uh, two, three. Give you those three. Everybody's got that. Do you want to have a guitar? Do I? Just know it's a no problem. Okay, so the first thing is actually very easy. All I did here is, and it says underneath there, in this example, we use an ascending mixolydian scale as a top note and only rootless chord fragments voicings. Should be an S there, sorry. Um, and then it says that apart from the penultimate chord, um, because it actually that's a full chord. It has, a, it has an F in the bass there. Um, the four scale degrees purposely, um, purposefully omitted, meaning when we harmonize the mixolydian scale, you will see a gap at one point going, hang on, this scale only got seven instead of uh, six instead of seven notes. Um, I've omitted the perfect fourth of that scale, and I'll tell you for why in a moment. Okay, most guys, you may have come across this. So the, the idea is simple. We start off with an E chord, E shape, like this. We omit root and fifth, so we're ending up actually with this chord. Yeah, that's basically all we do. So our chord fragment is seven, three, five. That's what's left of the chord in terms of intervals. Seven, three, five. Yeah? And now all we do is we just move that top note. We're gonna move that in a mixolydian. That's the note we're gonna omit in a moment. In a mixolydian sense, um, further so we go. C on the top, then now we need a D. And now we have an F, uh, an E flat on the top. So that in itself gives us already melody in the top. And here what I do here is the typical blues language. You snap from the minor third to the major third to get that little, that effect as if you slide into it. That comes originally from big band playing, that going into it, um, semitone um, uh, via semitone. You can approach any chord via semitone below, by the way. We have some, some, some good examples of that in a moment, yeah? So here already we've got some riff ideas um, in order to make, um, you know, a little, um, uh, you know, a little melodic line on the top out of this chord fragment. Because the beautiful thing is, once we free up fingers by playing smaller chords, we can actually start moving and using them somewhere else. If they're all tied up somewhere, that's where the trouble starts. Yeah? So this is the first three notes, and we start here. It just happens to start on the C here of that mixolydian scale. By the way, I haven't explained that, but that's happening simply because it is um, the lowest note I can find here on that B string. I could have dedicated any string. I could have said, look, I want to do this on the high E string anyway. I just decided to do this on the B string. Um, so we're standing, standing in an, or staying in a nice tenor range. We don't go immediately and maybe infringing on the solo player's um, voice or go too low down and get an, an annoying the bass player. So that's kind of that, yeah? Makes sense? So here we go, again. So Jack, do you want to, is that better if I do this like this? Can you see that better? Yeah, lovely, okay, here we go. So. So that's a C, that's a D in the top, it's an E flat, yeah? Lovely, so now we have to go move up and we move actually just up to the next shape, that's it. Um, move up to the next shape, which is basically coming from a C shape. And we are omitting the root in that shape here. So if you think of a C7 moved all the way up to the eighth fret 
and then you're having here nine, sorry, seven, eight, six, more to the point. That's our next chord fragment, and that's in terms of intervals, three, seven, root. Yes, yeah, so you have. Yeah. And now here I've got the, um, the octave on the top, and all I do is now my little finger place the, um, uh, the nines on the top, the G natural. And now um, I'm gonna go move this on to 10 here. So this moves on to what's basically the A shape of the chord. Yeah, so I've got this. Yeah, that's on 10, 8, 10 on the D, G and B string, 10, 8, 10. On the G, on the D, G and B string. So now we move this this um, this up. So I'm jumping over the B flat, and I would have had now a choice to go back here to the C, but I thought actually it might be quite nice if we if we continue, but we go up to the um, actually the, the voice that's written there is um, is this one here. Um, so you can play that one, there's no problem there at all. Um, or you can just play the ninth chord there. Um, so... That's it. And on this one, because that would mean you have to do this, and actually it would be better with the ninth, uh, with the chi in the top. You can just do this. Or, oh, sorry. Yeah, that'd be really nice. Thank you. So we have here the, um, the D on the top. Yeah. And now we move on here to this voicing where we just bar on the tenth fret. We have the E flat on the top. Now here we come to one of my favorite voicings. Then we have the F on the top here. And then we're back on our initial, initial voicing, but this time we use the top note. And then, so that's the wrong chord here. And that's the one with the F in the bass, yeah? Can move it all the way up, yeah? So what we got now is this. First with the F. In the first position, the next position on the C shape. A shape. And then here um, we go and stay in the A shape, like what we what we call here a um, James Brown type of voicing, uh, the dominant nine voicing. This time it's a C on the top, and I just remove the root again. That's a C Tyler. Yeah. Then this one goes to this voicing here. Then this one goes to the Steve Ray Vaughan voicing. This is. 13, 12, 10, 13. It's a dominant 9 chord there. Then we're back onto the E shape, the chord fragment. Then we're down on a D shape, the A on the top, and then we're jumping over the fourth again, and we're back to the um, A shape 9 chord. Let me, let me get you one, sorry. Jack, do you mind just handing it up? So, now this is more of an exercise than anything, but of course it allows us, each one of those positions allows us to do something with it. So we can do... Yeah, so we can do little riffs, little ideas with it, um, if we wish so, yeah? So this is um, uh, uh, an exercise to get the... Um, to get the entire Mixolydian scale placed on top of a dominant chord, so the scale and the chord are together. Yeah. And we got it all the way on the top, yeah? And it sorts the entire fretboard out, and they're all F7 chords with different um, extensions on the top. As you can hear, here's the fifth on the top, so no extension. 13 or the six on the top. Minor sevens on the top. 
Rude on the top. Nine on the top. Well, actually, the voicing I've written down is this here. Um, major third on the top. Fifth on the top. Thirteen on the top. Made minor sevens on the top. Rude on the top. Nines. Major third. And a perfect fifth. Yeah. Cool. So now when you when you comp. This will help, you know, again, to find little, um, little comping patterns. So for example, yeah, that's just between that nine and the root here in the top. That, um, uh, that nine top, the other one here, is that's a typical one. It's a James, James Brown, the 13 going to the fifth, so that's basically barring here the 12th fret. And then six, five on the top in terms of interval. Yeah, so you're ending up with um, um, you're ending up with sort of at the very least two notes or three notes always next to each other and then of course what you did actually jumping between the different voicings um, then Yeah, what you you went immediately to, uh, to doing yeah. that, yeah. and um, so you're ending up with actually melodic content or riff-like ideas, but also your comping sort of sounds, not just from a groove like what well, the is sort of a typical sort of a bottom-heavy groove, and that's all cool, but it really is on the bass and on the kick drum. It kind of it does all of that, so your sonic spectrum is a little bit. Well, it's a little bit unbalanced, maybe, or can be unbalanced, and you can counteract this. The more people you have, the less you have to play also in a band. That's also very important. So when you're ending up having, you know, four or five people, I know you're playing with a keyboard player, right? Um, and you have bass, you have guitars, sometimes two guitars. Um, so you're ending up, actually, everybody has to find their own voice. Anybody seen... Um, sure, you've seen all of those little NAM clips or, or music messer. Frankfurt type of clips where like three or four guitarists sit together and jam a bit, right? So you get like, um, you know, I don't know, Josh Smith and um, uh, Kirk Fletcher and um, uh, I don't know, Jimi Hendrix. It's clearly a live show, right? Um, uh, all, um, all sitting next to each other and, and jamming. Hologram. It's hologram, it's hologram me in, yeah? And one goes, okay, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> what it does. The next one does um imagine that was a five that was awkward. Um, uh, and then um, maybe then the other one goes oh, hang on a second now we got all of this occupied I need something else right and he might play um, um does something else and so you get this this little spread um, uh, you know ideally maybe even rhythmically maybe if somebody would have played I may have not even done that much now on that top bit you know I may have only made play one two e uh, mm. Mm.
There's something, you know, spa, something else that's just sort of um, giving, giving a top bit. Um, I always find that very, very good to kind of know, okay, what notes am I actually allowed to do? Of course, the minor pentatonic is a good one, but in a, in a comping, when you comp on a dominant chord, just adding minor pentatonic sounds a little bit naff. So you have to have some major content somewhere, and then mix the lead in, it becomes my go-to naturally right this is just one of those one of those sort of things so that's a really good exercise um that's are we going on to the second example in a second but i just want to show one other element which we'll do together this is something again i don't want to i want you to go home and use that creatively right so rather than kind of going okay here's a set pattern it's kind of no this is the notes and now let's find something let's jam this out let's make my own blues comping i think that's really really important in that um but I want to show you a little routine, which um, on the other side, that's the opposite of what we just did. Instead of a chord fragment, it gets us in one position through a couple of different shapes and also has the same effect of creating really cool riffs and really cool comping ideas. Yeah? So you can do um, those sort of ideas. Those sort of things, yeah? And that's a really nice little idea because it just basically gets us through more than one chord shape in one position. So it, it freezes up, you're not just being sort of stuck in one place. And um, this is based on a, an E shape of a B flat dominant seven chord, or any dominant seven chord, just I don't know why I'm picked B flat, I have no idea. So I could have picked a no, more awkward key if I tried, right? So there we go. So we go to C, C easy to think. So we go. Yeah. So we, we need major third here, so root, perfect fifth, minor seven, major third, fifth octave, or in, fr in frets, eight, ten, eight, nine, eight, eight. Eight, ten, eight, nine, eight, eight, that's it. And the trick is, this one played as a minor chord, hammered on. So we do three, four. Three, four. It's not on the sheet anyway. And four, and... Three and four and three and four and lovely. That's our first um, thing. The next thing is a minor seven flat five chord. This one is seven eight seven eight on the A D G and B string. Yeah? So seven eight seven eight on the A D G and B string. That's it. Now this one we also use with that sort of slight blues slam, but you can see we can't hammer that one on the same way. So here, we go from a semitone below, yeah? Anybody knows what, that, what chord that makes? You have, to long, you have long enough fingers to do that. A ninth. It gives you a dominant ninth, it's a beautiful sound, it's really warm. Great sound, really love that. So what we have in this now? Got that one? So that's a dominant nine chord, yeah? So now we're gonna go and balance this. And actually earlier played this one, but we actually we're gonna go into this one. Yeah? This is a bit more fiddly, this one, but it's nothing else but another dominant nine chord just played in a different place. So we get different sonic quality. This one here is played on the D string, G string, B and E string, and it's 10, 9, 11, 10. 10, 9, 11, 10. And the fingers you have to start with is your middle finger, on 10, index finger on 9, little finger on 11, and the ring finger on 10. Otherwise, the fingers are going to be tied up. Same idea. So we go. And again, this is a semitone below. Yeah? I'm doing that slide in. That's a common theme. Yeah? Cool. So we have a, um, a, a sort of a rhythmic, sort of a Motown -y one. One, two, three, four. Slow blues one. Three, four. And a funky. Just a 16. Daka. Two, three, and a four, and a one, and 
the two, and the three, and the four, and the one, and the two, three, and the four, and the one, and the two, and the three, and the four, and the Try all of them, and four, and one, two, three, and four, and one. Ah, it was really late, yeah, sorry. Two, three, and four, and three, and four, and. So now we can be cheeky, we can go back with our minor pentatonic. We can do this, three, and four, and. So you can now have a little double stop, and as Nat explained last week, is that the blues is in this in a micro bend up, so you're not quite a semitone out. And we just go down a minor pentatonic, and I like that six major six going to the minor thirty instead of even you could play that, which is a bit more of a rock and rolly type of thing. This is a bit more nasty blues, yes, yeah? six minor third going back to the fifth and the octave and then enclosure that makes sense to get it slowly so double stop on a G and a B string on 10 double stop on the same two strings on 8 and then we just hammer on that one note in the middle, trying to get that chi ringing so. Yeah, so that's pick, pick, hammer on, and it just happens really quick here. And then we solve down to the to the C natural. That's it. That one, two, and three, and four, and... Three, and four, and... Two, and three, and four, and... To fours, yeah? So that's another exercise where we now we stay in our position and we go on through different um, uh, different approaches we can we can have on the comping there. So one of them was a horizontal approach, and the other bit is much more vertical, where we sort of stay in one position. All of them, I think, those two those those are the two ways really. You know, you can think about chords if we're not getting into actually talking about the inversions and kind of having bass notes they're leading into something else, which we get to um, in a moment. Now, when I said earlier this mixolydian is really, really important, there are a couple of other scales and a couple of other sounds you often hear. Many, many times you listen to a blues and you may have heard something like this. Uh, take it, take it an F. Yeah, this little... Oh, maybe a major third. That's a kind of a, a dissonant sounding chord, right? So, and there are in essence four of them we use all the time. And dissonant chords work like indicators. Like, you know, we talked about the altered scale a lot, and we will talk a little bit later about this. You will talk with Nat about this in the half whole tone scale because it's part of modern blues playing, or has become part of modern blues playing. And, um, as soon as you play a chord that has a dissonant effect, even the dominant chord in itself should be dissonant, but we've grown a little bit immune to that over the years, um, you need to resolve. So that's a great little thing to do. So let's say you play a blues, a blues, your blues. let's go back to C here. You play a blues in C. Now we want to G. 
change. It indicates a change, right? Once I do this, it's inevitable something happens. So you're saying, look, listen out everybody, something is gonna happen and make this really obvious. You're putting a little post-it note on it, you're marking it, you're highlighting it, right? So those chords are called altered chords. You may have heard about this, an alteration is usually a non-chord tone added or non-scalar tone added to the chord, to something that's belonged to it, something that deliberately makes it sound dissonant. Yeah? Cool? So again, the next exercise when you look at it actually really focuses on this. It just looks into an E and an A shape, as we know on the guitar, so this one here and this one, and good ways of producing this again on those known chord fragments. So if you go back to the very first chord we had, that first chord fragment, this, this one here, Actually, let's rewind a moment. When I say there's four notes, they don't, they're not in the scale. Let's, if you just pick the Mixolydian scale there for a moment. We know Mixolydian is a major scale, but it has a minor seven. That's the only difference it has. And that minor seven makes it sound a bit bluesy. Lovely. We're forming with the seven and the third in that chord. It forms particular, in that scale, it forms a particular interval called the tritone that makes it sound dissonant. And it wants to resolve, yeah? that's what it does. So it has a function, Mixolydian scale has a function of wanting to resolve. We now learned, okay, that this resolution can be enhanced by adding notes that are not in it. So if I have seven notes in a scale, how many notes are left in Western music that could be in there? They're not in the scale yet. Five. It's only five, right? There's only five notes left, really. Now, the major seven is not considered a alteration. So in Mixolydian we said we got a minor sevens in there. So what's left? What, what are the notes that are left in the altered scale? Then, or which are notes that are left that could be altered? We've got in Mixolydian we got a major scale intervals, root, second, third, fourth, or root, major second, major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, major six and minor sevens. What's left in, in the middle there? Flat five. Flat five, great. Can you give me one? Second. Second, so the flat second for example, fantastic. Can you give me one? Which 11? Sharp 11? Sharp 11 is yeah. great, yeah, absolutely. Which is um, flat 5 and sharp 11. And then, can you give me one? Anyone? The Hendrix chord, what does it have? Flat 9 is a great one, by the way. Flat 9 is a great one, or sharp 9 is the other one, yeah? So what we got is actually the 2s, so flat 9 and sharp 9, and the 5s, which is flat 5 and sharp 5. But as you quite rightly said, sometimes you see a sharp 11 instead of a flat 5. Now, if you're not familiar, and, um, and depending on who's going to watch this, um, do you, you all know how those numbers work? Yeah. Yep. So a nine is a second up an octave. An octave has seven notes, the eight notes are repetition. So if you're on eight notes and you want to have the, 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 the second note or um, repeated up an octave, it becomes your ninth note. Yeah? Eight is your first note repeated, so nine is the second note repeated. Um, when we talk about alterations, we very often talk about them an octave removed from the root. Right? And alterations and extensions normally go at the top end of the chord. It doesn't mean you can't have a flat 9 in the bass. That's absolutely normal to have, actually. It's not a problem. There with diminished chords, we do this a lot. But um, it's commonly when we talk about them and we use them, we use them as what's called voice leading on the top. Yeah, those sort of things. Um, that's kind of, that make a lot of sense. So, with this in mind, here is a little sequence. Um, this first one here, this first dominant chord, as we had, it had a fifth on the top. If we remove that fifth by a semitone down, we get a flat five, right? Also called sharp 11, yeah? So the flat five, which is the sharp 10 when you go up an octave, yeah? um, becomes, uh, um, sorry, um, uh, 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 it's the um, 12, sorry, um, uh, the, the, the fifth is the 12, of course, becomes the flattened not the 10 is up the rubbish, the third. Um, the, the 12, um, the flattened 12 becomes the augmented or the sharpened 11, right? That's the same thing, the meet on the same spot. Yeah, so that's this one here. Now in the same spot, the fifth can be also raised to a sharpened fifth. It's also often known as a flattened six. Again, somebody might crucify me saying, well, it's only a flattened six if there's a natural fifth implied, and it's a sharpened fifth, of course, when, there's, um, when the fifth is replaced by that, or it's not in that particular scale or harmonic contents. But we leave that one in a minute 
to a theory section and we rather looking into how to use them in a moment because they're fun to use yeah so we've got this now um, and then the next one here is the flat nine that look actually like diminished chord that's like a really easy one that's it so you get a minor seven here of the f dominant chord major third fifth flat nine that's it and then the last one is a bit harder to do is this one yeah so if you don't get your fingers around it that's the sharp nine one so we got here the root major third fifth and a sharp nine on the top it's a hendrix chord played in a different in a different voicing yeah so one more time what we got is this sharp 11 flat 13 flat 9 sharp 9 yeah? again this is an exercise often you only use one one of them we like and go oh that's a cool one that sounds a bit you know like it wants to resolve to um uh, to or sounds good in my in my chord sequence but it's just one way of getting all of them organized in one position and that's it okay all the altered chords now you can do the same thing going up here and this voicing you know we had this this voicing here so this is the c shape voicing and we're just now going to do this yeah so eight seven eight seven oh, eight seven seven eight seven that was really bad <laughs> so you get again the chord fragment um, with the flat nine on the top then you can do the same thing this time with the sharp nine on the top so flat nine sharp nine then here I bar I'm adding a couple of notes here sharp 11 on the top this one is actually um, a really useful chord this one and then the last one um, we're putting a um, sharp nine, sharp five. So we're putting two alterations in. I really like that. That's a lovely warm sounding chord. So that's seven, eight, nine, nine. Seven, eight, nine, nine. Yeah. So now we've got a way of harmonizing a mixolydian scale. Sorry, and then we can go. Yeah, and we can um, uh, we can use the um, alterations here um, uh, to to create this sort of tension at the end of a sequence. We need in order to um, uh, to highlight the cadence that's coming up. Yeah, the five one altered chords like the altered scale work particularly well when you resolve via a perfect cadence. That doesn't mean you have to resolve to the tonic of the key you're playing in. You just got to make sure that the chord that precedes or the chord you want to alter um, is the chord that um, resolves either up a fourth or down a fifth really in order to make that perfect cadence and then you've got, um, uh, you've got a really clean sequence there. Okay? Lovely. So the next thing in example three, we're doing the same thing this time with minor chords. Yeah? And I'm going to go do this a little bit quicker because the system is understood. However, the chord fragment we're having is G minor chord. Yeah? It's just simply that. Yeah? So it's 8, 10, 8. Yeah? So it comes from this chord. There was a G here in the bass. We don't do this, so we do no, no G in the bass. We have a G here in the bottom, though. Yeah? And now we do the same thing here. That's a really lovely G minor voice, by the way. That works in a pop setting as much as in a blues or jazz setting there's a G minor 9 we do the same thing here we put a a mixolydian scale and uh, a Dorian scale really there that's just A10 Um, um. Yeah, I'm not too sure about this badger here. Um, I'm not sure what I was thinking there when I was writing that. I probably didn't didn't correct the um, didn't correct this um, the way I wanted to. So here on this one with the A in there. 
that's a much nicer voice you have with the E in the top, so with the natural six on the top, yeah? So you're having this here for starters, G minor, then G minor nine, then G minor with a major third on the top, then G minor with an 11 on the top, yeah? Then here G, G minor with a, f a fifth on the top, and now here we just move the whole thing up, looks like an A minor chord really, just moved all the way up here to the 12th fret. And then we just put our little finger underneath to get a, to get a six in the major six. Get the mate minor seven by just moving the little finger up one fret. And then here, over the six is a really nice, again, a minor six voicing. It's a lovely, um, lovely Dorian sound there. Cool. So this now, this idea in itself should equip us now. We got a minor and a dominant chord um, really to do this with. Those are the two chords when you play um, uh, sort of extended blues chord sequences. You know, they always come up. And um, uh, so often you have a dominant chord. Let's say it's take a blues and C again. So for one chord C. F. melodic line so here this was a two minor chord into the five chord I just split the five chord into a two and a five chord which is a very common thing to do which the two chord implies a, a five sus sound really and so they, they, they have the same properties they have the same um, resolution tendencies really so two and five they work in conjunction you see this a lot um, in um, when, when people start ex extending changes that they put in front of every five chord in the first instance a two chord um, in order to kind of have more bass motion going on have a more um, movement going on but it's just another way of outlining the same harmony and now we have some some melodic ideas for this and now we can borrow from the dorian scale on the minor we can borrow from mixolydian on the dominant and so we can make up our own little comping patterns and ideas yeah? cool so this is this gets us now into the nitty-gritty of it so if you go over to the to the next bit we've got a little um a little comping idea here. So I gotta go see if I can get this together. This is what, what I would call a, a practice routine. It, it's a lot of different things. You can see on the chords on the top are in there. It's in itself a sequence you can happily play on a, on a, on a gig. There's absolutely no problem at all with it. It's, it's very common um, uh, cliches all the way through, but it's a lot of them all in there. So I'm gonna go play this really, really slow. Um, so you get an idea. The first bit you can see it's a little um, uh, a little sequence into our sequence. So we have a little um, uh, beat into it. It's a couple of beats into it. One of those, yeah? And the chord voice we're playing is a 13th. That's it. And now I, I was a bit lazy notating that, so I just sort of again um, written down the right voicing and then I've written a long and a short one in terms of rhythmic um, capacities So that's it. So it's a, it's, a, it's a little sequence, a lot of stuff packed in there. But um, here's the, uh, this bit is particularly nice the A minor. Yeah, that's 
like a really nice sort of um, uh, walking bass line incorporated into your chordal playing um, and a little, little, almost like a little turnaround figure before, the, um, uh, before it actually turns around in that sense, okay? So we're going to go through that in a, um, in a sort of slow motion way. So the first chord is an inversion. Anybody knows which inversion is this? It's we're an F7 and we start on E flat. Inversion, third inversion, absolutely right. Yeah. So, so I'm gonna move this away again so you can see my see my hands again. So I spill the coffee. That's it, yeah? And now here, this is basically what we call voice leading. Yeah, so we're trying to stay. With our, with our little finger here on the top on a consistent note. And it sounds like we're tying the music together. We don't just jump around. I think it sounds really, um, really sophisticated. That's a nice, that's a nice sound to that, yeah? Okay. Everybody, everybody with me so far? So we have that. F chord, and all we do is that something you can do all the time. You can approach, especially on a slow blues, you can approach anything from any distance you like. Yeah? So, um, you know, you can go, you know, if you wish. But right? so that's really not the point. So you've got to, it's very typical to do. So you're coming from the um, flat six, six, seven. And again, because it's a mellow sounding chord, um, uh, it really, um, it really, Works sounds very chancy just because of that. There's no other reason. And then this one again looks like a minor seven flat five chord. This is our B flat dominant nine chord, directly borrowed from the exercise we did earlier. And now here, do something on that on that dominant flat nine chord. You can do this. two frets, move it back down two frets. Again, you're implying different um, notes from the Mixolydian scale there. So that's the eight, seven, eight. Going back to that's it. And then back to the uh, to the 13 chord, the white one, ideally. So now here comes one of my favorite part of it. And so here we're going to go back to the to the F chord, and what happens here? We first play the F chord on beat one and two, one, two, then F sharp seven. It's, just, it's called a parallel chord movement. Movement. So semitone up, F sharp seven, F sharp seven, nine, thirteen. So you get the 13 E and then the 9, so dominant 7 chord with a 9 and a 13. If you write it out, you'd only actually write F13 because you only write the top, the highest note really in there. Yeah. However, um, uh, this one I've written this as an add 13, so you know there's no 11 in it really. Even though it's kind of on a dominant chord, you presume there's no 11s 11 11 in there. So the first one you would have made, the 11? The 11s contradicts the third. That's the problem with it. So um, you have to, um, it's called an avoid note in technical terms. And avoid notes are a semitone above important chord tones. So you can be a semitone below, there's no problem because the gravity is different, it goes down. While um, this one here, if you have a B flat on over an, over an A, um, you're, you're ending up having this, um, uh, this, this sound in there. And um, it only works when you do, when you don't play them together. So when they're all clean intervals, they stick together. As soon as you put both of them together in there, it really does sound, it, it sounds wrong. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's considered an avoid note. That's, the, that's in, in classical music is anything that's a semitone above an important chord tone. And um, in, in generally we omit that one. Yeah, we omit that one first. That's why it's the first one to go, because it makes, makes no sense in that sense. Yeah. So, um, where was we here? Yeah, so this one here. Yeah. 
has such a lovely little um That's it, yeah? So here, I'll just show this in context. It's nice, huh? It, it, there's a total chromatic chord. It's a total chromatic chord, and it works for two reasons. First and foremost, on the second half of the beat, of the bar, sorry. Um, so it's in beat three and four. Therefore, that's the bar that's, or that's a part of the bar that points towards the next bar. So the tension in there, in essence, outlines, because it's, you know, it argue, you could argue it's a dry tone substitution of the five, it outlines tension towards the chord. It moves away from the chord like a rubber band and it wants to snap back. That's actually its function, right? Now, harmonically, yes, you could argue it's a five chord um, in there, but I don't think we need to know that, honestly. I think it's it's from a playing point of view, um, yes, you could argue it's a dry tone substitution. What difference does it make? It's a semitone above the chord we're playing on the second half of the bar. And um, from a comping point of view, that can be used like a lick. No, and I think that's um, from a from a practical point of view very um, very useful. And then with parallel chord movement, it sounds particularly great when the same chord moves down. So you move all the voices parallel down. So you play the exact same voices. Now down here in the F chord, it's a bit of a pain in the ass for a little finger. Um, it gets easier when you do, when you go high up, right? It's not as much of a, of a, of a sort of a finger twister. Oh, you, your little finger's actually double jointed. Mine isn't really, really hurt. Yeah, yeah. I watched this last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> very good. Okay, so this is it. Now the next bit we've got is an interesting one. Yeah, so we've got here now a B flat over F uh, sharp, or you might argue an F sharp minor seven, uh, F sharp minor six chord, F sharp minor major six. That is major six minor third perfect fifth on the top. But in essence, what that is is a dominant chord with its fifth upper semitone again so we're setting up that four chord now that's coming up exactly the same way first with a semitone above and then we could resolve into this I'll show you what it would sound like in context otherwise it sounds a bit a bit um, uh, weird so here we go go into the four chord back to one now semitone up back down now the turnaround Yeah, you could do that. Sounds really nice, huh? I'm setting this one up. However, we have one more chord now in there. This comes back to our altered chord idea. And actually, it's just sort of crammed in. You don't have to play that. This is perfectly sufficient. But as I said, it's a practice exercise we're doing. So we're cramming in everything we can find. Probably too much for a tasteful blues comping. But um, here we go. So we come in here out of this F sharp, uh, F13. F sharp back to F. And now... So we're cramming in one more chord, we're cramming in here the F7, sharp 9, sharp 5. So in essence what we do here is playing a semitone out, a chord that points towards the chord we want to do. Then we're going to point another chord, that's the extra 5 chord of the B flat we want to go to, it's the F chord. Make it sound as ugly as possible, so therefore I have no other choice but to resolve. go back to my voicing to my nine voicing here yeah? makes sense and what I get with that also is light and shade I get chords that sound dark and chords that sound bright and I like to actually do this by changing position here on the right hand side yeah so for those first three I might do this oh, sorry. with the thumb yeah? highlight in the different bits because when you go low down here and you do something like this it sounds really muddy and you can sort of unmuddy it by be really be really soft on the low string because you want to balance the strings when you strike them and um, be a little bit more pronounced on the higher strings and you get a really nice sparkly sound on the top and actually when you comp all of a sudden that stands out and the rest sinks back in the background and I, th I always think this is really important to understand what's called inner dynamics 
of when you're playing, so not everything is just hammered out in one, you know, in, in one specific dynamic, which can be can be very very tedious. Uh, um, and uh, it just again, it sounds it sounds sort of a bit a bit amateurish, you know. So as soon as you add dynamics to anything, it sounds it sounds a million miles better. Yeah, cool. So. Um, now, this is back to the B-flat. We've done that one already a couple of times. Now, this is an easy one now because we've... One, two, three, four is how I've written it out. I'm sort of comping a bit like it would be a 12, 8 here, really, so I probably should have written that in triplets. But fill in the gaps there. It's just about those chords. You may play this in a fast blues, and then you might play only half of those chords because you won't have the time or it will sound really rubbish if you try to cramp in four chords of bar on a 200 BPM blues. It's gonna be boot off stage. And then I wanna hear anything here but Pete said. None of that. <laughs> he promised me this would be good. <laughs> cool. <coughs> Everybody good? So now here comes my favorite part of it. There's a little bit of harmony. Um, any of you guys remember chord tone family substitute or chord family substitutions? That's a really good one. So we're in the key of F. In the key of F, you can substitute any chord, any one chord, with other chords from the same one family. You get a one, a four, and a five family called a tonic, subdominant, and dominant family. And um, the tonic family has the one chord, the three chord, and the six chord in it. So whenever you could play one, you could also play three, meaning the third note of that scale harmonized. So in F, the third note, F, G, A. So now, what you can see here is that that four chord should normally go back to one at this particular place. It should be two bars of one, nothing else. Yes, it should be, basically if I play this in a traditional sense, we should have one bar of F, a bar of B flat, a bar of F, two bars of A. B flat, back to F. And that's it, yeah? That's what, what it should be. Nothing, well, not, we might have, not even the turnaround in the end, really. I'm not sure it's like more, more um, bad routines here. Um, but um, we don't go back to that one chord in bar number six. We're gonna go for five, bar number seven. Um, we're not gonna go um, back into the one chord, we go back into the three chords, so we use that substitution. And then we earlier mentioned, whenever you have a five chord, you can play a two chord. Well, whenever you play a two chord, or whenever you play a minor chord, sorry, you can play its belonging dominant chord underneath, so pretending it's a two five cell, yeah? So you can play. And then um, we can use with that, we can use a, um, uh, we can use it as a link into a little turnaround figure. And I'll show you that now. It's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to do in a slow blues, yeah? So we have on the four chord. And now instead of one, we go three. Let me just play that A minor like this. just all barred down, nothing on the A string. Play an A minor chord, nothing on the A string is always good, isn't it? But it's a generic voicing, so it's not specific for the A minor. Then the D7 Hendrix chord. That's it. That leads us into, technically into G minor. And that's all we need there, really, at this, at this, at this place. The G minor, by the way, is the two chord. In, um, uh, in F major, so they're all part of the F major scale. And we're now going a little bit more mixolydian on our comping than just the one, four, five um, uh, of that. So we're using more notes of the, of the scale we can use in order to create harmonic motion, yeah? So, basically what we got here is this, yeah? A minor. Into the G minor. Now I've written one more chord there, the G sharp, seven, sharp, five. Anybody knows why, what's going on with that chord? I could have actually also written down there a sharp 11 chord, it may have been a better choice, but um, hindsight is beautiful. Tritone substitution. Tritone substitution, yeah? Tritone substitution means two dominant chords a flat fifth away from each other. They share the same resolution tendencies, therefore they can be always substituted. They're easily spotted. A tritone substitution is a dominant chord that resolves down a semitone. 
while a normal dominant chord resolves up or down a perfect fifth. So it goes up a perfect fourth or down a perfect fifth. That is, or which is the same note. Yeah? So it goes either up to that note to the G or it goes down to the G. That's why it goes up a perfect fourth or down um, a fifth. But the tritone always goes down a semitone. Yeah? So you can spot them um, simply by which, um, you know, if you have a dominant chord thinking, hang on, it sounds like it resolves, but it doesn't look like it resolves. If it goes via semitone, you go, oh, it's because it's a tritone. So it's a root note of that chord, of that D7 chord is substituted. Just gonna keep those two notes. By a root note, a tritone, a flat five away from the original chord. And you can see that the other parts of the chord are actually identical, and that's why that works. This is called the functional cell, by the way, the stuff that actually makes the resolution happen. Yeah, and then that resolves back into this. And now, what I said earlier, we can use on a dominant chord that resolves, we can use ugly stuff, any of the alterations. I've opted here for the sharp 11, and you would do the sh uh, sharp five, sorry, in the top. You would do this if then your little finger moves up to the seven of the next chord. Yeah, so you're ending up. Top, yes, ending up with it. However, I think it sounds a bit rubbish, so that wasn't a very good choice. What I really would do probably is A minor, D7, and then G dominant, G sharp dominant 7, sharp 11. Because that sharp 11 is the 5 of the chord I want to resolve to. It ties it in much nicer. Back to the voice leading in the beginning. I play two chords with the, um, with the right top note. And I'm ending up here with this. Um, ending up with this. Uh, this is going to be an awkward moment, isn't it? No, 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 no. We nailed that one. Beautiful. Um, so, and now the next bit after that, I wait, I wait quickly till you've, till you've written this. Yeah, dominant seven sharp eleven. So you're having the D on the top for the G sharp. Is a D on the top. I mean, you know, experiment with all of them, by all means, you know, the sharp 11, the, the sharp 5, the flat 9, all of the ones we had earlier. That's just, um, in hindsight, when I've written out the exercise, um, uh, I don't know what I was thinking. Probably not much. It's lovely. Ah, it's one, one cold coffee, that. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, you don't drink cold coffee at all, do you? No, no. <laughs> Gahang used to nice hair on the um, uh, inside of your leg. It's a, it's a, it's a, yeah, yeah, it's a rumor, by the way. <laughs> Don't quote me on that. But if I next week, if I have an endorsement with a coffee company. <laughs> okay, cool. So sharp eleven here, and now this is my favorite part. Yeah, we have now a, a little turnaround figure, and what we're doing is. harmonize that. And it's such a lovely little gospely turnaround. Yeah, so we do this together. G minor, again we do those, um, the sort of the lazy voicing as I call it. Um, so it's just like two fingers on the fretboard, nothing on the A string. So it's three, 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 three. They're all threes. And that goes up a tone to A minor. And now we play two diminished chords, B flat diminished, again a three note voicing. So it sounds like going to A dominant, that's what it sounds like for a moment there. So That one up a semitone, so it's two voicings in essence, two minor voicings, two diminished voicings. Yeah? And then that last one is a B flat major triad, played, um, played like this, so I can't, <laughs> played like this. Little finger, middle finger, and sorry, little finger, middle finger, and index finger. So we have the ring finger free to play the C. Here, what I did, this is a sus chord, by the way. Yeah? So, with C sus, the five chord played as a sus chord is a gospel thing, really, rather than a strict blues thing. It's done a lot, but um, you know, T Bone Walker did it, we looked at it last week. A lot of big bandy type of things do it, suspending that five chord. Um, but um, in um, 
in reality, this is something that's a bit more gospel -y, sounds a lot more gospel -y. So I play the whole figure, coming out of the... Um, I, I play it all the way up to that, so we get the context, and then I show you how it goes from there. So it goes like this, um, from the F. Um, I then resolve the sus into the major third. So all that becomes a C dominant nine chord. Yeah? Now that's all, that's just playing around with it. And now there's hundreds of choices. I don't know why I opted for this. It's actually a, a rubbish decision I made there, but it gives a good practice exercise. What I would do, what it sounds to my ears, that's what it sounds like to me, you should be doing on the top. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense, right? What I've written is this. Uh, sorry, no, no. Go on, actually, into this one, going on to the F, yeah? So. And what it does is it's a beautiful little thing because it gets you 13, flat 13 or sharp 5, perfect 5th, sharp 11. So it's a nice little. Nice little voice moving into it, but it sounds a bit crowded. It doesn't actually sound particularly good, isn't it? It sounds sort of a bit, nah. Um, however, good for the practice. In reality, I'll probably do a lot less there, yeah? I'll probably on that turnaround go. Then I go back into the, yo. Oh, resolve back into the, you know, do something a little bit more licky or something, a bit more bluesy on that, on C blues. Um, in order to go back into that F chord, yeah? And then it's just written out a, t a, a, a little um, turnaround, this time with a bass motion implied. You can see already when I was comping, I was implying a couple of bass motions because it's um, nice when there's no bass player. But this is a really cool thing to do where you go. Yeah, it's like, there's one of those. And that sounds really nice because your bass chromatically just leads into the note. And you just pick however many notes. If you do it in 16s or in 8 notes, in 8 notes you have one note. So you do... Um, uh, where are we? Yeah, if you, we have eight, no, I mean 8 notes and you play an 8 notes pattern, you got one note there. So you pick the note, semitone above or below. It doesn't matter which one you pick, it's up to you which one sounds good. Um, uh, and. Um, this one is a triplet, so we have two notes. We have the chord plus two notes lead us in. So we go two notes above or two notes below. That's about as, as, as technical as that gets. Um, but it's a really nice sound. Yeah? So you get this. Yeah, that's a lovely little um, uh, detail uh, thing in there, okay? Cool. I'll play the whole thing one more time, so it's also on video when you guys go back and want to pick out some of those bits and bobs. Um, hopefully, um, in essence, but hopefully um, uh, it made some sense. It's crowded, isn't it? There's a lot going on. But it's a great chord study without having to study the chords first individually. So what we had is first the individual ideas laid out as in, hang on, they all belong to a scale. The chord and the scale, they're part of one and the same. And if I want to have melodic content in my chord, I've got to know what scale it really belongs to or I'm allowed to play. At least it gives me a framework to work with. I always recommend your ear is what gives you in the end the real sort of go ahead, right? If something sounds rubbish but is right, there's no point in hammering it home. Um, so, you know, you're, um, you know, it's got to sound right and if it's then wrong, and you can't explain that but it sounds wicked, well, play lots. You know, that's kind of um, really, really important in all of this. So I always see the theory as fun and good to know but it's, it's there to give us a little helping hand onto stuff we would have not checked out without it, but not there to give us to finish the job off for us, okay? So um, we then moved on this in context, really, um, to look at this in context and having some nice, um, uh, having some nice comping ideas going on. We have this little comping pattern and here it goes. Oh, one, and again, I've started with the thumb and at my pick, actually, I was already wrong. Normally I keep my pick in here in order to get actually to the pick 
Um, I'm sure you guys got all your own methods. Anybody got something else? What do you do, Tyler? Do you get quickly back on that? That's yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, you you do that, yeah. I, I have to, I had to practice that. I used I used this one is is so far the most successful one. I mean, I still lose it, right? Which is hilarious. It's like you keep it then, it's all good, and then the one moment you use it, it just goes. It's like you may as well not bothered holding it. It's kind of you know it's a bit of that, isn't it? So um, uh, it, it happens. But um, there we go. Um, we, we, we take that. Um, here we go. One, two. Sorry for that, but um, at least you got one record of um, of those different voicings. Cool. How are we doing for time? Well, Twenty minutes. Lovely. Also, for you into the next one, there's uh, errors. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Lovely. Cool. Um, now we've. Um, oh yeah, it's the right notes and the wrong pen and the wrong um, tap, isn't it? Yeah. Nice one. Thank you. Cool. So now this is something Nat is going to go move this on, and this is the fun bit. But I want to quickly um, highlight something about those chords. That's why I'm always hammering chords and harmony so much home. Nat said it last week. Um, just Miss made a big deal out of it, saying, look, in order for me to know my harmonic stuff, and my melodic stuff, and what, what I'm allowed to play, actually, a lot of it comes from knowing what chords to play. So seeing what you can do in terms of chords comping over a blues gives you a really great insight into seeing what you can do melodically over it because all you have to do is just take that chord and play some element of that chord and it becomes melodic, right? So you can play, you know, for this idea here, the you can play that, you can do three, two, Yeah. That's so you can use that. I think I've got this back. Flat should make better B flat then. Do one more time something nice. So, yeah. 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 Going into that B flat there. Playing an F sharp, F sharp chord, wrong, wrong pattern, it, wrong, um, playing the F sharp. So you have that as a as a as a possibility. Now, if you play it like this, like I just did, just as I tried, it sounds of course a bit rubbish, right? I give you that. But if you play it like this, two, three, four.
was F sharp was in there, Captain. Now you see F sharp. Yeah, it sounds really in, yeah? With a triad, you get a line yeah, coming out of the. Oh, bollocks. Yeah, going into the going into the um, B flat chord, and there's plenty of um, uh, plenty of other chords in there, of course. So just to pick this one chord out there, that's a um, really important one. But apart from this, of course, we've got now also scales, and we know the minor pentatonic scale is a really important scale in blues. We know the major pentatonic scale, so I omitted those. A really important one is mixolydian. Right, we talked about this already, we harmonized it already. And um, I think you should do a little exercise just for yourself doing something like this. Yeah, mixolydian, um, G mixolydian. Let's say if you're in G, I don't know what I've written out in, in G, everything is an F. I've written this one out in G. So I'm um, uh, awkward. You can play this G mixolydian, yeah. then C. Change in that position to C mixolydian. Yeah. Then you go to the D chord, change to D mixolydian, then to C mixolydian, back to G mixolydian. Now you can make this a little exercise and then you can do something like this. changes going through just using the mixolydian staying in one position so this is sort of three levels um, of, of engaging with it one of them is just running it up and down the fretboard in isolation so just to get the sound of that scale right? then running it together with a 12 bar blues form changing um, ideally it's called continuous scale exercises one and two and three and four and C and two and three and four and G two and three and four and to see into G into D into C back to G. Now that won't make you play blues, but it will show you where those notes are, they're not in the pentatonic. Yeah? So when you play Yeah, really, those are two notes you're really missing there. And um, uh, it gives you that sense, and it gives you much more linear sense for the blues, a bit more of a modern approach um, uh, than if you just play the minor pentatonic or major pentatonic. Yeah? Cool, and of course it needs to be all mixed. There's no such thing that, you know, blues solo is just made of one thing, of course. So um, that's just another way. The next thing is the Dorian blues scale. Robin Ford uses that a lot. Dorian has what intervallic pattern? Would you know, Jack? Is it a minor or major scale, Dorian? Fantastic, minor. So, um, what type of six does he have, minor or major? Is it minor? Major. major, that's perfect. Um, so you've got a major, major um, six, you let everybody else off. That's very good of you, very brave anyway, thank you. Um, and so now what we do is we play pentatonic with a flattened, um, flattened fifth, so a blue scale, and we're adding the six instead of the sevens. That's a fantastic sound, yeah? So if we, if we do this in G, it sounds like this. such a cool um, blues sound yeah over a dominant chord that sounds fantastic three four
lovely now, yeah? So, you get, you're adding, basically, what you're having is two dry tones, yeah? You have the flat five, which we just said in a blues scale. And then you have also from the six, going to the minor third, another dry tone, yeah? So you're getting some, getting those sort of sounds. The sounds, of course, really, um, more bluesy even than the blues scale, in a sense, weirdly enough. Um, and I really, I really love that sound. I dig that sound very much. Um, as said, Robin Ford is a big advocate of that. Um, I'm sure you heard him talk about this. I mean, you can't avoid that, really. It's a big scale. It's a great one to practice. Again, I mean, let's just go first. Do that, and then you can go through an actual um, uh, a sequence if you want to, like for the G. For the C, yeah, so you're now playing that same thing here, um, the C major pentatonic, also um, uh, adding the, the six, and you can either, you know, instead of kind of going all the way up here, and do, uh, sorry, C minor pentatonic, C major pentatonic, absolutely rubbish, instead of going all the way up here, um, stay down here, so you're getting here the five, six, yeah. sound a lovely sound that's over the C chord then you do the same thing stay there over the D chord yes yeah, so you're playing a, a D minor pentatonic here starting four five uh, four sharp four um, five so you get this position six octave minor third four flat five, five, six, there's a bit of an awkward one. sound with that um, a major six and then again you know you can just go through the one four five step door and blue scale another one is Lydian dominant that's now getting a bit more stray from what we know Lydian dominant um, is the fourth mode of melodic minor and it's a dominant uh, it's a dominant um, scale that's used um, uh, really widely over dominant chords, static dominant chords, you use that. Uh, any dominant chord that lasts a bit longer than, than, than uh, you know, four bars, you can use it over so anything that's, um, that doesn't resolve immediately. They're called non-functional dominant chords. You can always use it over that. It's the go-to chord for dry tone substitutions. It's um, a go-to scale for dry tone substitutions. It fits over it um, uh, like a glove. And um, it's normally when you go from a, uh, when you play on a four chord in a blues, you use the Lydian dominant sound because that Lydian dominant sound means it's a Lydian sharp 11, it implies this, but instead of a major seven, there's a minor seven, that's where the dominant comes from because it's sort of a mixed Lydian scale mixed with a Lydian scale. So um, you have all the intervals from a Lydian scale but a minor seven. And um, what it does is that Lydian note, so in G, uh, in C, sorry, with me in the blues of G, we go to the four chord, the sharp 11 in C is the F sharp. Yeah, that's the, the fourth note raised, is the F sharp. Now this also happens to be what's used, what we know in, in natural, you know, normal music theory as the leading note back into G. So now all of a sudden we get a chord that is technically non-diatonic, non-resolving, a four chord, dominant chord, should lead to, to F. It actually has now a leading function back into one. So it's actually the more right sound when if I want to res resolve this back into one. So I can have one on pentatonic. Say. With that Lydian dominant sound. Now I've played some really like a scale up and down, it's not very bluesy like this. Um, uh, but you know, you can of course play a nice little um, blues lick. Yeah, so 
they get that Lydian. Lydian. Then they are getting that one back into the um, into the one chord. Yeah? So Lydian dominant is a big deal, really. Um, I mean, Michael Thierry when he did the masterclass for us, one of the first things he I think he did when he played a played a little dominant static dominant thing on D seven like a James Brown thing, and then played the D Lydian dominant scale over that, which is basically a melodic minor. Um, it's a forced mode of of, um, of melodic minor, and um, uh, yeah, so that's kind of a really nice go-to thing. How am I doing for time? Four minutes. Lovely. Two more scales. There's the altered scale and the half whole tone scale. Now both of them um, uh, fulfill the same function. They want to resolve via perfect cadence. So the altered scale sounds like this. I want to read now the first octave. And the altered scale is called altered scale because it comes back to what we said earlier. It's all the notes are not in the scale, they're in there. So or they're normally not in a mixolydian or in a major scale, they're packed in there to make it sound really angular and really out. And that's our indicator, yeah? So this is something one of the favorite things any blues player now does. You play a one chord. Then you go to the four, you play an altered scale in the middle as if you would play an altered chord. We just do it now with a scale. Yeah? It sounds really like it wants to resolve. It has that ability um, in build really because all the ugly notes are in the old notes going, hang on, where's my key? Where's, what's going on here? So it, it, it's basically um, uh, showing you it wants to resolve. The half whole tone scale fulfills the exact same function. Right? It has almost the exact same notes you might notice. There's very little difference between the two of them. However, altered is used on chords that don't feature a natural six. If your chord has a natural six, like if you have a dominant 13 chord like we had earlier, where this one here is a major six, the half whole tone scale is your go-to scale because it has a major six in it. While if, if, the, um, if the chord function is a augmented fifth, which is not in a half whole tone scale, then, you're, um, uh, then you would use the altered scale. Other than that, on any other chord pointing on anything else, even if they have a natural nine in there or something like this, you can use either one of them um, quite, free, quite freely. Did you not meant it? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Are you sure? Sharp. Um, say again? Really sharp and alterations. Mm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, any, I mean, that's anything is game. There's people use the whole tone scale um, uh, on that. They use um, uh, chromatic. Chromatic is the big one, right? So anybody, I don't really want to write this down because this is something most people do anyway, right? So they go. Um, <laughs> such an obvious thing to do to go like semitones out but you get in essence an altered scale right in essence yeah you get um, and then you resolve from there let's say they're going into the four chord for, um, just by a semitone that sort of stuff I think most guitarists will have, will have practiced right using a scale you're always ending up being very detailed in the exact notes you want to have. Right? If you use something um, uh, chromatic, you're very often more interested in the motive. And ideally, you do both. You know, you want to be somehow in control of the alterations you're doing, um, and then you're in control of the um, of the motives um, as well. So one of the famous ones, and it's the last thing I'm going to do, um, is for example, using just a single alteration note. You don't have to play the whole scale like I just did. It actually can be a bit enough. But use a single, one alteration, because you know now the alteration is the bit that adds you. Um, uh, the the um, the notes they wanna they wanna uh, move. So let's say you play G again. Yeah. So now we added just that G sharp, uh, that D sharp, to make it a G dominant seven sharp five. Just one note borrowed from the old third scale. Yeah. Inside our pentatonic. Had 
a sharp nine here, sorry, and a sharp five in there. Um, and so you can construct really beautiful lines. Just think about that the best thing we can always hope for is a semitone resolution. So if you find a note there's a semitone next to the note you want to resolve to your, your melodic line, which is hopefully a chord tone you want to resolve to of the next chord, you're always getting it right by default. Right? And so you can construct your lines like this without worrying about if it's a well, you know, a whole tone scale or if it's anything else, because you could argue that sharp five comes from all sorts of different scales and all of you know Nobody would be right really on this or wrong because it's depending on whatever you thought or you may have thought nothing, really. Cool. Okay, there was a lot of different things, but hopefully that provides a good framework for when that comes back next week and that's the language of the different albums and then the warns and then the um uh, and then the other the other good bits that go in between. So thank you very much, thanks for um joining in. Lovely to lovely to see you, yes, fantastic. Well, thank you guys, thank you guys. Stop it. But um and yeah, thanks. I think you have to press the stop. Um.